Thank you. That was a performance of the Jazz Standard Alone Together. In his contribution to Adrian Parr's The Deleuze Dictionary, the philosopher Jonathan Rofe neatly summarised Deleuze's simulacral critique of identity as the affirmation of a world populated by differences in themselves which are not copies of any prior model. The usefulness then for me of a Deleuzean concept of simulacrum in my theorization of what it is that jazz musicians do when they make new music with the standard repertoire is in the potential to eschew the hierarchical chronology of, on the one hand, the original composition and on the other, all in tune performances of the same. With no prior model to shackle any given rendition of a jazz standard to the predictability of a representation, difference, internal, affirmative and in itself, becomes the ground without ground, the sound form, which enables novelty in the event of music performance by dint of the singularity of its emergence in and of time. Indeed, in his own words, Deleuze promoted the world of simulacra over the model copy system specifically in order to, quote, remove essences and to substitute events in their place. To reimagine events in terms of what he memorably described as jets of singularities. From my experience undertaking practices research in jazz, I would argue that music making and performance can and should be conceived, epistemologically speaking, in such explosive terms. Far more than providing the mere objects of a musicological analysis post-festum, the work in processes of those engaged in the act of musical creation live and on stage set up the conditions for problematizing received wisdom concerning such processes in what I have in recent years been calling the event of knowledge. In this manner, setting up musical uh, ev events over musical objects, modes of performance over those of representation, I am aiming to draw focus away from the obvious effects of music made in performance to better understand something of the precursory causes. By the effects, I am referring to such criteria as the notes played and the gestures made. In other words, the whole panoply of audio and visual data that can be captured by various documentary means and presented and represented ad infinitum in place of the differential acts of performance in the event itself. In resonance with Deleuze's infamous attack on what he considered to be the superficiality of the phenomenological method, in which he proclaimed the whole of phenomenology is an epi phenomenology, discuss among yourselves, I am concerned to delve deeper below the surface effects of jazz performance to evoke a sense of the dark recursions at work forever beyond the reach of the modes of the documentary. However, despite all this talk regarding the epistemological weight of events of music making in performance, my theorising here is in danger of remaining at the level of the discursive. As the performance theorist Susan Melrose has argued at some length and repeatedly in her work, if we consider the theoretical to be solely articulable in specific registers of writing, we overlook the possibility that what she has termed certain registers of expert performance practice, but not others, might actually already operate as mixed mode and multidimensional, multi-participant theoretical practices. For a musical theoretical practice to adequately operate in mixed mode, multidimensional and multi-participant fashion then, it is obvious that it must balance the equation of discourse and music making and encourage the interplay of different voices, both verbally and musically articulated. For this reason, the trajectory of this presentation will once more move into the dimensions of the musical, as I give the stage, literally, to Mike Fletcher and a different performance of 
alone together. my segment I'm going to take up the critique of hierarchical chronology that Steve has just touched on. He suggested that Deleuze's concept of simulacrum is useful to the practicing jazz musician as it allows us to move away from the idea of the original and its primary and subsequent, subsequent manifestations and conceive of each performance as an event. I'm grateful to Steve for already having pointed this out because it allows me to make a confession which is that I've never heard the original version of Alone Together. So, rather than evidencing my lack of rigour in preparing for this, this presentation, I would argue that this fact is actually indicative of the way that an expert jazz musician engages with standard repertoire, as I hope you're, you will have seen from the performances you've so far heard. But if we're not performing the original work together, what is, it we're, what is it that we're doing? To begin with, let us reflect for a moment on what you've just heard, the solo performance. I, the performer, played a piece that, although it was largely improvised, was based on the standard alone together. You, the listeners, heard what I played. So far, so good. However, if we try and ascribe meaning to such an event, then things become more complicated. As I've already mentioned, the original hasn't been explicitly, explicitly evidenced in the process, but I have clearly asserted that what I just did was a, based on the standard rather than a spontaneous improvisation. So that might be what I call an alone-together event. But how can that be? At this point, I turn to Deleuze and his concept of the dark precursor. In Difference and Repetition, he wrote, Given two heterogeneous series, two series of difference, the dark precursor plays a part of differentiator between these differences. In this manner, by virtue, by virtue of its own power, it puts them into relation with one another. In this case, I posit that the roles of the heterogeneous series might be filled by our individual understandings of Alone Together. Of the dark precursor, Deleuze wrote, there's no doubt that there's an identity belonging to the precursor and a resemblance between the series which it causes to communicate, but that these identities and resemblances are akin to an illusion or an effect, a functional product, an external result. Therefore, if we turn our attention to the difference in itself, the external, whether conceived in terms of identity, resemblance or difference, is of secondary importance compared to the fundamental differences operating internally within the thing itself. Deleuze phrased that difference in, in kind 
of the internal and external as follows. It's a long quote, but I think it's worth reading in full because it's fundamental to the, the understandings of what we're talking about. Resemblance is in any case an effect, a functional product, an external result, an illusion which appears once the agent arrogates itself to an identity that it lacked. The important thing is not that the difference be large, small or large, and ultimately always small in relation to a greater resemblance. The important thing for the difference in itself is that the difference, whether small or large, be internal. There are systems with large external resemblance and small internal difference. The contrary is also possible. Systems with small external resemblance and large internal difference. What's, in, what's impossible, however, is the contradictory. Resemblance is always exterior and, and difference, whether small or large, forms the kernel of the system. So for me as a jazz musician, these words offer an extremely illuminating way of conceptualising the way I engage with standard material. As our performances have demonstrated, it's possible for a standard event to occur independently of, or at least without a direct reference to, the original. The privileging of difference over identity serves in this case to liberate the musician from the notion of hierarchical chronology and thus freely engage in the event. Although, as Deleuze himself advised, its identity will always remain indeterminate, conceiving jazz practice in terms of the dark precursor can assist in understanding how engagement with standard repertoire remains a relevant and active part of contemporary jazz practice. And once again, to return to the, the realm of the musical, I'm going to invite Steve to offer a solo performance.
No, oh, no, there's, there is more. There is more. Be ejected, oh really? Okay. Oh well, I suppose we can finish it there if that's yeah. if we really have to. How much more have? Oh well, another five minutes for me, another five minutes from Mike, which is probably. If you can compress yeah. it into five minutes all round, I'll make sure nobody breaks it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, let's leave it there. That's, you know, it, it, if it's if it's for the good of everything, the rest of the evening running on time, I, I don't want to you know, pick odd little bits from my script and force Mike to do the same. I'm quite happy to, okay, to leave it there. Really to ask well, well, thank you so much, you both, for the pretty wonderful uh, uh, performances. And it is indeed in the performances themselves that my, let's say, my, my question stems from, so to speak. And because I know the, I, I know the piece um, a little together fairly well as a bass player, I play it often in, in, in various ensembles. And what I um, liked about, especially the, the latter two performances, is that it kind of, let's say, distances itself more and more from, let's say, the, well, for lack of a better word, original. I, and I, I have to admit, I don't know the original either. So I, don't, I only know the, uh, the, 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 the score, of course, from the real book and not from something else. Um, and I was wondering whether or not we perhaps have arrived at the point that any performance can be said to be your rendition of Alone Together, as long as the performer, him or herself, says as it, that it is. That even though it cannot be audible, that he usually says, well, that I'm inspired by it, and therefore this is my solo performance of that piece. Is that something that would fit in your conception or the universe's conception of the simulacrum? Is that taking things too far? It is taking things too far. Uh -huh. uh, but <laughs> um, I, it's inevitable, really, in this kind of experiment that that would be a question and a concern. Uh, you know how with the, the, the Deleuze and, and Guttarian thing of the rhizome and then the arborescent system, the rhizome is so attractive that it's easy to lose sight of the fact that they didn't present it as an alternative to the, the arborescent system. It was, let's not forget that this is another way of, of conceiving of things, but it has a relation to this this other way of, of, of conceiving of things. And that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of that historical, hierarchical, chronological way of thinking about, yes, of course, uh, Dietz and Schwartz did uh, publish a piece called Alone, a song called Alone Together, which was premiered in 1932 as part of a not particularly successful show called Flying Colours. <laughs> uh, Artie Shaw recorded it in 39, Dizzy Gillespie in 1950, Miles Davis in 55, and then, you know, it's enter the repertoire of um, all jazz musicians if they're worth their salt. Um, so there is still that historical, uh, original <coughs> copy system in place. What's most profitable and beneficial, from my, in, in my concern, of taking a Deleuzean simulacral uh, approach to the standard repertoire practice is it does allow you to conceive, first of all, of your own playing, your own particular contemporary music making in a different way. And also, uh, we, don't, we don't have to be beholden to all of that historical baggage. Even though, inevitably, the moment you finish, and the performance, like now, we're in a position where the performances are, are over, uh, we can spend, it'd be easy to spend a lifetime comparing and contrasting what just happened to those historical performances, and that's you know, a, a valid uh, work of music analysis. But the thing that interests me most is what is going on in that particular moment of music making in performance, and the simulacral model, the idea of there being a difference in itself, an internal difference to all of these things we identify as part of the standard repertoire, that, for me, resonates more strongly with what actually goes on when you're making music, then the idea that you have this, the shadow of, you know, like the shadow of Beethoven, like <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's the, in the actual moment of performance, there are liberties that are afforded the performer that the difference in itself model, for me, uh, highlights in a way that other conceptions don't. It's very useful that <laughs> Very useful appendix to your presentation. <laughs> that's the kind of the, that's a summary of what you didn't get to hear. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, it's very
<laughs> Any more questions? No. Then thank you very much. Thank you.